through some tough times in that 12 years. And that was something we could celebrate. But uh, in 2001, there was a recession and I had just been appointed and there was a hiring freeze. I didn't even have a vice president uh, for the financial affairs part at that time. And I wound up learning much more about the budget than I had intended because I didn't <laughs> have someone. I had people who were backing that role up. I don't want to mean that they, I didn't have help. I did. And then in 2008, we had a, a, a tremendous recession in 2011. We had uh, the bombing of the Pentagon and uh, and so many things that happened that we dealt with as a as a university community. And so the great part about being a leader is the chance that you have to bring all of the people who matter to you, uh, whether it's the people who were hurt in 9-11 or the fact that we had to protect all of our uh, Far East students and make sure and Arab students and Muslim students to make sure that they didn't suffer harassment. So with every challenge, having a great community around you. Hey everybody, I am back with another episode of So What Success Stories. And today I have a special, special honor of talking to Dr. Shirley Raines. Dr. Shirley Raines is President Emerita of the U of M, the first and only female president of the University of Memphis so far. She is a speaker, a longtime author, and a leadership consultant. And I'm super, super honored to be talking to her today. I read her first book, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And I can see myself in this amazing woman. <laughs> and I'm just, um, truly, truly honored to be talking to you today, Dr. Shirley Rain. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first I wanna tell you, I'm honored that you can see yourself in the book because that's what I want. I want particularly women to see themselves in this book. Uh, it is a leadership book, and it tells the story of my early days. I grew up on a farm. I was a sharecropper's daughter uh, and was until the seventh grade when my father was able to afford a farm. So I grew up on a farm and with a small community and learned a great deal there, as one might expect. I was fortunate to get scholarships to college and uh, went to the University of Tennessee Martin, later to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville for a master's and a doctorate. But I've traveled all around with appointments. I've been a Head Start director. I've been an early childhood educator. I have, when I, graduated from college. I went to teach at the University of Alabama, later in North Carolina, where I did an intern, uh, a special mentorship about accreditation, then to Oklahoma, Virginia, and to Florida, and from Florida. All those times I was a professor but each time I also was asked to become the department chair, which was astonishing to me since I was an untenured professor. And most of the time, the tenured professors hold these roles. So it was then that I began to recognize that maybe I had some special talents as it related to getting along with people and leading people and planning programs and so forth. Then I became Dean of the College of Education at the University of Kentucky and later Vice Chancellor for Academic Services there. And it was there that I was encouraged to apply for the presidency of the University of Memphis. I was encouraged by a former president at the University of Kentucky, but it was my need to get nearer to my family. My mother was ill and I really 
told them I would do anything. I just needed to go home to West Tennessee because I, my parents uh, lived 72 miles from Memphis. And so I would do anything to get back to Memphis. But lo and behold, that anything became president of the University of Memphis where I served for 12 years. I was honored to serve and was one, I am still uh, in modern times, the longest serving president. And I was honored to have this wonderful group of leaders who worked with me. And it, it, it's not my success, it's our success that, that led me to uh, have this wonderful 12 year journey. And that's what brought you to, um, to my knowledge and seeing, I, of course, I was no longer a student there, but, um, but I, I remember just being uh, in awe and amazement that we had a female president at the University of Memphis. And so I have a lot of, a lot of questions about what you, know, what you did while you were there, but I want you to give you an opportunity to talk about your family just a little bit before I get into the questions. Well, I'm married to Robert Kennedy. My husband is a former professor and he's a stained glass artist and a wonderful person. And I have one son, Brian, and two grandchildren, a daughter, granddaughter, Riley, who's 13, and Bryson, who's 10. And they are the reasons that I live in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and have made a life here for myself after I retired from the university. That is awesome. That is awesome. I have one son and two grandchildren, too. <laughs> I was like, I know how special they are. I know how special. Yes. Well, Dr. Raines, in this program, I have what I call the So What Success System. And it is my belief that if anyone can learn how to overcome obstacles, eliminate excuses, and calculate choices, they can have So What Success. And that is success in spite of any obstacles they face. Right. Reading your book and knowing quite a bit about your story, I know you are an amazing So What woman. <laughs> well, thank you. You. That's a great compliment. <laughs> you ask you are absolutely. My first question for you is about obstacles. Talk about some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome to get to where you are today or to achieve the success you've had in your life. Well, I think the the first obstacle is poverty. I mean, I grew up in a family that certainly had enough to eat because we lived on a farm, but we didn't have many of the other opportunities that children and families with money had. But I grew up in a community where my family went to church and where I had responsibilities from the time I was very young. So poverty is one obstacle that many people have to overcome. Um, my mother was a very positive person and uh, worked on the farm, worked in the factory, worked in a lawyer's office where she learned about handling uh, real estate and later became the first real estate agent in Crockett County. So there are, there's an obstacle and a model there. The obstacle is when you have someone who's highly successful and you want so badly to make them happy, an obstacle is when you focus on pleasing your family or others rather than doing what is best for yourself. But the great modeling was all the things that she, that she overcome, overcame. An obstacle also is one that many women know, which is, can you be taken seriously? I can remember some of the things that were said to me. You're far too cute to be an administrator. Or how do you manage to deal with all of those difficult men or all those other things? Well, I was the oldest with two brothers and my mother had 11 children on her side of the family and my dad had 10 on his. So I had dealt with men all my life and didn't think anything about it. I didn't think it was unique to be able to deal with men. So an obstacle is how others perceive you and your abilities. When I started in administration and moved out sort of in my, of 
my lane, which was child development and early education, people would say, how can you as an educator relate to these engineers and these business leaders and athletic uh, coaches? And do you know anything about budgets? Well, I had dealt with budgets all my life. Anybody who comes from a farm family has dealt with budgets all their lives. But it is that perception of what we don't know that is an obstacle or how people perceive us not to be able to know something. So continuing to prove yourself without pushing so hard that you're trying to make a point all the time. Yeah. It is to gain the confidence, gain the trust by doing a good job and showing what you know. Wow, Dr. Rank, you said a lot in just a few minutes. Um, and it takes me back, like going back to you growing up um, poor in farm. So that's part of where I could relate um, a little bit. I didn't grow up on a farm, but my generation before me, my mom and both of my grandparents on both sides of my family um, grew up on farms. And, my, and I'm really, really close to both of my grandmothers, especially. And they both always talk about uh, their life on the farm and growing up poor and and I grew up relatively poor even though we were no longer on the farm but even talking about thinking about some of the other things that you said takes me back to my interview with an, um Bertha Looney and Lucy McClellan of the Memphis State 8 and I just want to take a second to give you your props because you were the one who brought them to our knowledge and I say our meaning my generation and all the students who came after me really and a lot that came before because even when I was a student at the University of Memphis starting in 1997, I graduated in 2001, I didn't know anything about the Memphis State Eight who were the first black students to desegregate the University of Memphis. And, um, <clears throat> and I just wanna applaud you for making, making us aware of such important people in our history. But thinking about them and both of them talked about very similar backgrounds to you growing up, you know, poor. Of course, they had different challenges, some other challenges. Right, but, definitely. More <laughs> challenges than I. Definitely. But yeah, but they um, talking to them was was amazing and talking to you was, has, is amazing in that same, for that same reason and growing up with that early beginning. And then you talk about going into leadership, right? And the right. challenges women face and that makes me think about some of the other conversations that I've had um but I'm super excited so let me talk a little bit about your decision to become a woman leader <laughs> and also share a little bit about what made you um want to share the Memphis State 8. Well uh let me go back what made me become a leader was that I was continually tapped on the shoulder and being told, would you do this? Would you do that? Would you lead this? Uh, in fact, I was a department chair three times before I ever applied because people would say, we need you to chair this. Now, again, as an assistant untenured professor at the time, that was rather remarkable, although I did get tenure uh, a year later. Nonetheless, uh, being told, will you do this and accepting. And I, I like to tell women and men when an opportunity for leadership comes your way, accept it, do it. Thank you. I love you do it. not know what the next step may be. But finally, I said, look, <laughs> maybe I should try applying for some of these positions instead of waiting to be told. And I think many people, women particularly, wait to be told. So I started applying and later became a department chair of a very large department that was spread over three campuses in Florida and had 44 professors in it. And then because of an unfortunate circumstance, I began to look around at the University of Kentucky and, and find my husband is actually the one who, who found the position announcement and said, you really should apply for this. 
And I did, not expecting to get it. And so I was very free and open with my discussions with everyone and and served there for six years. And three of those years, I had two jobs simultaneously. I was vice chancellor for academic services and dean of the College of Education simultaneously. So, uh, and nobody, I do not recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> it, because it it was my unwillingness to give up the college of education that I loved and wanting to take on a new challenge, but that led me to the to be seen as a viable candidate for president at the University of Memphis. So even though I don't advise it, I realized that that experience in the broader university realm opened the door for me. Wow. Now talk about, let me go back a little bit in talking about the Memphis State Aid. First, I have to give credit to Mark Stansberry, who was on my staff as a community liaison and assistant to me. And he and I worked on that together. I don't want to take all the credit. And also, uh, I, I was so fortunate, I was able to appoint the first African American vice president at the University of Memphis, Charles Lee, followed by the next African American vice president, Rosie Phillips Bingham, who I know is well known to you. And so I was able to uh, integrate this wonderful leadership team at the university and thought nothing of it but at, but other people seemed to make more of it than than I did but I was fortunate then to have Mark who helped me relate to the community and I'd already established uh, the the Institute for Social Justice with Benjamin Hooks and so it was a natural way that we should uh, take notice of the Memphis State Aid and get the historical marker on the campus listing all their names. And at that time, they were all still alive. So I had the great, great pleasure of meeting them, talking with them, knowing some of them better than others. But um, it certainly was a milestone in my career and something I was thrilled with at the university. I mean, I think that was, it was major. And like you said, you just did it because that's who you are and that's your heart. And, and you didn't think a whole lot of it, but it, it was and is major. It is major for all those that came after them. So all the way back, long before you were associated with the University of Memphis, um, it's, it's major. And I get, really get emotional about it. Um, and I'm just grateful that you made us aware. And now Bertha Looney is one of my closest friends. And yeah. I give you a lot of that credit. <laughs> well, she is wonderful. But I, I would say, Summer, that it's also very important that all of the white students at the university and Asian students and Indian students and everyone become aware of the Memphis State Aid. It's important for you and your legacy, but it's also important for the whole of the of the university and uh, so i you know we went through some tough times in that 12 years and that was something we could celebrate but uh, in 2001 there was a recession and i had just been appointed and there was a hiring freeze i didn't even have a vice president uh for the financial affairs part at that time. And I wound up learning much more about the budget than I had intended because I didn't <laughs> have someone. I had people who were backing that role up. I don't want to mean that they, I didn't have help. I did. And then in 2008, we had a tremendous recession in 2011. We had uh, the bombing of the Pentagon and, uh, and, so many things that happened that we dealt with as a as a university community and so the great part about being a leader is the chance that you have to bring all of the people who matter to you uh, 
whether it's the people who were hurt in 9-11 or the fact that we had to protect all of our uh, Far East students and make sure and Arab students and Muslim students to make sure that they didn't suffer harassment. So with every challenge, having a great community around you, and we had students who had problems and we had the death of a student and so many other things that happened, but because we were caring, my wonderful leadership team was composed of caring people, the faculty, and took advantage of, of uh, making sure that our other faculty and students were well taken care of, or there were just so many things that we faced, but every leader does, just as Dr. Rudd has had a great deal to face as well. Um, so I would just say, yes, I'm grateful for all the people who signed on to work with me and that I signed on to work with them, which means you let them take their initiatives as well and support them. I think that's I think that's amazing and I and I you know definitely credit to you to acknowledge the people who were there for you and who supported you. And I even talk about the challenges and I'm glad you said that because being a leader is hard. <laughs> Being a leader in any capacity has definitely um, its fair share of challenges. And especially, I guess, I would guess as a woman leader and a first female leader in that position, I think it would have some unique challenges as well. That takes me to the next part of So What Success System, which is eliminating excuses. Because you could have made a whole lot of excuses why <laughs> you didn't become a leader and you know, why you didn't get in your position or excuses within your position um, and excuses personally too. What are some excuses you've had to eliminate from your life so that you could be be successful and be who you are? Well, the excuse that that I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. In reality, when you have a team of people, you'll never know enough personally, but your team will know enough. And so, building on the knowledge of other people. So don't let your excuse of not feeling like you know enough, impede your going on and solving the, solving the problem. There's, other, there's also the, the excuse of momentum. Um, the, the excuse, now's not the right time. Well, if you're thinking about the problem, now is the right time. And so we have to let the momentum of a situation or of history or of what is going on in the world or what's going on right there in our own offices, we have to let that momentum carry us forward and face it rather than avoiding it. So the excuses, uh, the excuses can be many. I can't do this because we don't have the money. I can't do this because we don't have a, a good dean in that college or I, I can't do this because the alumni are not involved or or I can't do this because the athletic department has uh, some issues with the coach. We, we can't let any of those things stand in the way of doing whatever needs to be done to get the business of uh, education moving because we're there for the students. And if we honor that, uh, we're there for the students and that makes us there for the community because that's where we live and serve, then we can't let excuses stand in the way of doing what is the honorable and right thing and getting it done. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm beginning to sound preachy and I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I love it, I love it. And I think it takes, that's, it takes that passion and conviction as a leader um, we have the exact same mindset that you can't let any excuse. That's what so what is about is, is so what you don't have the money. So what you don't have the knowledge. So what you don't have the people, you figure it out, you move forward and you figure it out. And I'm looking, looking at you too. And I'm thinking about your book and, and the excuse 
that you could have made as well growing up in a small town, right? Growing up on a farm. And you didn't necessarily have role models who said, this is how you become an educator. This is how you go to college. This is how you become a female leader. And this is how you become a, the first president of a major university. So those could have been excuses for you too, right? Right, they could have been. <laughs> they absolutely were not. <laughs> <laughs> they were not. Um, I think there's also, you know, I was born with a certain amount of drive and getting it done and a way of life of who I am personally. And so you have to be true to that, uh, not sit on the sidelines. And so that's, you know, that's part of it. I love it. Like they could have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, that takes me to the next part of the solar success system. Um, which is calculating choices. Because like you just said, they could have been. They could have been excuses. But you made a choice that that's not going to be my life. It's not going to stand here. I'm going to move forward and I'm going to achieve these things. Talk about some of the other calculated choices that you've made throughout your life. Well, I, my calculated choices were to continue in education. Even though I seldom had the money, I had to find a scholarship or find a work opportunity. When I was doing my doctorate at the uh, University of Tennessee, um, I took on a job as a professor and started a, a community child center at a community college. And that was just so I'd have enough money to do my job of being a student, but it led me to learning even more about how higher education works, for instance. So um, a strategy is if you need it and want it, find a way to work it out. And it may not be what would be the traditional role. Um, there was no way, I had my son at that time, that I could live and support my son with a graduate student assistantship. but if I piece together a puzzle of finances of doing these other things, I was able to make it. So, and that, that same thing actually works on a grander scale of the university. You may not be able to do all you want to do, but you have it as your goal. And so you have to piece together. When I started, or we started the School of Public Health at the university, the School of Public Health was drastically needed at the university and given the health status of people in Memphis and the Delta area, it was really important to have a School of Public Health. I tried partnering with UT and at that time that didn't work. Um, and so we decided to start our own and I looked around the university and plucked people from different colleges, business, health, education, nursing, and put them together to be a School of Public Health. And that was, was a wonderful decision on the part of the university to let me do that. Um, the Tennessee Board of Regents, others could have said no, but because the need was so great, and we could find a way to find the resources, although they were not traditional by any means. And that's a strategy. You have a need, you have a desire, and finding ways to put the pieces together, much like finding ways to support yourself as a, a doctoral student became, became the objective. So um, Sometimes learning those lessons from long ago, my father and mother treated everybody with a great deal of respect. And I'm going to tell one story that I'm, I'm sure that Bertha Looney has heard, but I don't know about others. But my mother had a stroke and was, was in a nursing home uh, for 18 months. And every Sunday I went to visit her. She could not speak, but people came to visit her. And I listened to the stories that they told about my mother. And she heard them, but she couldn't speak in return. But I also heard about all the people she helped as a realtor. One man came in, he happened to be African-American, but I heard this story from white people as well. But 
he came in and he said, uh, well, I, I wanted to see how Miss Irene was doing. And I told him and he said, well, I want you to know without Miss Irene, I wouldn't have my house. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, the bank turned me down, but they would never turn down Miss Irene. So it, it was, and, and I heard that from other people, not just this African-American gentleman, but others as well. And it is because of the respect that my parents had for everybody and the way they treated everybody and the way they made a way for other people was a great lesson for me. And I didn't realize how profound that was until she was where she couldn't speak. And, to, and many of these stories I had missed because I was living somewhere else. But I think that inherent within our families, we have the opportunity to be and to gain uh, respect and it and it will it will serve every leader well um, the first event I went to at the University of Memphis after being named president was uh, for the facilities people the physical plant people uh, they were having a picnic and I went there and just was with them and they said no one had ever done that before and I was surprised but not to speak ill of the other other people, right. but, but that I felt a tremendous need to be with everybody who was at the university, and I'm pleased about that. But I also felt a tremendous need to be with those professors and researchers who were making a difference in the world. So it was not one versus the other, it was us as a university. and. And I could tell many stories about the alumni, but I'll stop there. No, I love it, Dr. Raines. And I'm just listening to you. And I just, I'm really, really grateful. And I feel blessed, even though you weren't there when I was there at the University of Memphis. But I am an alumni. And I am very active and involved, as you already know. But I just feel so blessed that we had the opportunity, we, meaning the University of Memphis, had the opportunity to benefit from your leadership. And then I love how you share how your childhood and your parents and your upbringing played a major role into in who you are and it's your heart. So you're super intelligent as we know, <laughs> but, but it's your heart. I believe it's your heart that, um, that made you a great leader. And then as well as your courage and your strength and your perseverance, I just think that's amazing. And, um, and you obviously have displayed the ability to overcome obstacles, eliminate excuses, and calculate uh, your choices so that you could have so much success. How do you personally define success, Dr. Rain? <laughs> well, I define success for me, for my son, for my grandchildren, personally, as using what you have been given to the benefit of others whether that is in your church or whether it is in your community group, whether it is in, in your alumni organization or whether it is as a university president, what can you do to benefit others? It makes you successful, sure, but it makes the organization or everyone else successful. And the same thing is with the family. What, what can I do with my family to to help them along the way. I love it, I love it, I love it. And it's, it's beautiful and I always like to ask that question because I know um, my own definition of success change. It changes <laughs> as you grow and then as you mature. And, um, and I would guess that that's the case for you too. And I love your, your definition, I love it. One last question for you. Okay. What advice would you give someone who wants to be successful? And I'll change this up. I ask the same questions in every interview. But for you, I would like I would I would ask, what advice would you give to a female leader who is is going against uh, or has a number of challenges that she's experienced? What advice would you give? Number one is stay true to your values. Stay true to your values because without uh, staying true to those values, then you will find yourself lost, and you won't have an anchor to come back to 
to think of what the next step is or what should we do with this difficult situation. So my advice is first, stay true to your values. Second is look, knock on opportunity's door, look behind that door at that opportunity. If it's good for you and your values, take the first step, go inside the door. If it's not, close the door gently and go to the next one. Not everything that comes your way is the right decision for you, but be sure you're looking for the doors to knock on. Um, an opportunity will not always knock. You have to be the one knocking on the door, but you can look behind it and see what seems to be right. And if it's not, and I had some of those things that came along and I didn't, I didn't go that way. Um, and there were times that later I think, oh my gosh, why didn't I do that? But in reality, I know that the next thing that came along made it better for me and a better match. I don't know if I've answered your question sufficiently. No, that was it. Those, those were great answers. Those were great responses. And, and honestly, I'm just reflecting. I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking about uh, my past choices and opportunity um, and the times that I did knock on the door that I went to seek opportunities. And I'm also thinking about the opportunities that were presented to me um, or that have been presented to me. I think this is awesome. I think it's amazing. Dr. Reigns, I think that you are amazing. Oh, um, thank you. You're very generous. I really do. And I'm, again, I'm just honored to, um, to have to now, even as an alum of the University of Memphis, still be benefiting from your, your, your leadership and to see all the amazing things that have happened since you've been there. Um, and I thank you. I thank you. And I thank you for your story. I thank you for your time. And, and honestly, Dr. Reigns, I'm so, I, every time you share something on Facebook or post or comment on one of my posts, Dr. Rain just coming <laughs> That's great. Well, I do notice, that's for sure. I, I love you. I do pay attention to people who are our graduates, and I wish you the continued success. You're doing so well, and continued success. Thank you so much, Dr. Rain. Thank you. Yeah.